G'day, this is Chris Savage from RL Ministries in Australia, welcoming you to this session of Israel Past, Present and Future. I pray that it will be of benefit to you and help you in your Christian growth. Thank you for coming along. We're in session 10 of Israel Past, Present and Future, and we're still in that section where they're talking about a, the two false concepts regarding Israel and the church. And, and, and the, the, first false, the first false view uh, was saying that uh, all believers are Jews, whether you're Gentile or not, the moment you believe you become a Jew. Uh, we covered that last session. The second false view regarding the fact that there's no difference between Jews and Gentiles, uh, it's uh, the second false view tries to make all believing Jews into non-Jews. Uh, so those who follow this view usually support it by quoting up to three passages containing a phrase to the effect that there is neither Jew nor Greek, and they build their entire case upon that. But if we have a good look at the, the same passages in their context, it, we'll, we'll be able to see that the distinction between Jews and Gentiles is simply erased uh, only in certain areas and not in all. So a study of the text uh, uh, considering the related passages clearly indicate that in other areas, the distinction is still very much in effect. That's between Jews and Gentiles, even within the body of believers. Now, the biblical passages that are used are 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12 to 13. We, we pretty much can know that one off by heart. For as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body being many are one body, so also is Messiah. For in one spirit were we all baptized into one body, where the Jews or Greeks, for the bond are free, and we're all made to drink of one spirit. What's this passage teaching us? This passage is teaching us that entrance into the body of Messiah is by spirit baptism. This is the only way, and it is true for all, whether you're Jew or Gentile. No difference. And this is all that this, these two verses are telling us. It's all they're saying to us. Second passage is Galatians 3, verse 28. There can be neither Jew nor Greek. There can be neither bond nor free. There can be no male and female, for you are all one man in Messiah Jesus. So the context of this passage deals with the matter of justification by faith and not by works. And this is the only way anyone can be justified, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. So what, what the passage is saying is that in justification, uh, there is no distinction between Jew and Gentile. That's it. That's, the, that's what it says. Third passage is Colossians chapter 3, verse 11, where there cannot be Greek and Jew circumcision and on circumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bondman, freeman, but Messiah is all and in all. Now, the context here, uh, or the, the, the context is the key to understanding this passage. <clears throat> From verses 5 to 11 of Colossians 3, uh, that was all it had to do was about was putting off the old nature and putting on the new nature. And this is true, uh, and this is a true and only way toward maturity and spirituality for any believer, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. So, again, uh, this is what the passage is talking about. So, you, you can't use these passages to say that there is. There is uh, no longer a differentiation between Jew and Gentile. In the areas of membership, the conclusion, pretty straightforward. In the areas of membership in the body, justification and growth toward maturity, the process is the same whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. There's no distinction. Now, this does not mean that in every area, the distinctions are forever erased between the two, because that's not what the scriptures tell us. The evidence for distinctions we see, if we look at these, if we look at the, the very same passages in light of related passages, it will show that they are not teaching against all distinctions. In fact, we'll see the reverse is true. So when the critics of the Messianic Jewish distinction refer to these three passages, notice they only cite the Jew and the Greek. They forget about the rest, the bondman, the free man, the slave, that sort of stuff. They don't mention that. <laughs> but, you know, the verses not only state that there is no difference between Jews and Greeks, they also state that there's no difference between bond and free, between male and female. Yet uh, the custom is often to avoid uh, mentioning those parts of these passages. 
Now, if you if we consider what the Bible has to say about those other ones, you know, the male and female bond and slave, and it's obvious that the three passages do not teach that all distinctions are erased, okay? Because there's still distinctions in those areas. There are five passages that deal, for instance, with the bond and the free. Ephesians 6, 5 to 9, Colossians 3, 22 to 4, 1, 1 Timothy 6, 1 to 2, Titus 2, 9 to 10, and 1 Peter 2, 18. Quick look at those. Now, uh, in all of these passages, the believing slave is to be in subjection to his master, even when the master is himself a believer. So <clears throat> the believing master is never commanded to release his believing slaves, which would be the practical outcome if, if all the distinctions have now been erased. There's no longer a master, no longer a slave. So what, what you can't have slaves. Release them all. But that's not what he's saying. The believing free man is still a free man. And the believing slave is still a slave. So how then are these passages uh, consistent with the three verses which we looked at earlier regarding neither Jew nor Gentile? Consistency is no problem, right? As far as membership in the body, justification and spirituality are concerned, the way is the same for the free man and the slave. Once in the body, these distinctions still exist. He's still a bond man. He's still a free man. He's still male. He's still female. She's still female. He's still male. Now, seven passages of scripture clearly show that all distinctions between male and female have not been erased. But what we see in these passages is subjection is the key to them all, as seen in position and function. First of all, uh, in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 3 to 10, it says the woman should keep her head covered in the assembly while the man should not keep it covered. Distinctions. 1 Corinthians 14, 34 to 30, 35, women are forbidden to speak in the church. This is to the extent that if she has any questions, she's to seek answers from her husband at home. Ephesians 5, 22 to 25 and Colossians 3, 18 to 19, the wife is to be in subjection to the husband, while the husband is admonished to love his wife as the means of subjecting her. Colossians 3, 18, same as, uh, Ephesians 5, 22 to 25. 1 Timothy 2, 11 to 12. Women are forbidden to teach men, for in so doing, they're exercising spiritual oversight and, and overstepping their place of subjection. Titus 2, 1 and, and 3 to 5. We, teach, we have the teaching there of younger women to be in subjection to their own husbands as part of the sound doctrine. Violation of this doctrine results in the word of God being blasphemed. According to 1 Peter 3, 1 and 7, the wife must be in subjection to her, her husband, even if he is an unbeliever. And on the other hand, the husband must honor his wife. If all distinctions then between male and female were erased, there'd be no need for all these passages because there's no distinction anymore. So, do these passages then contradict the others that indicate no distinction between the male and female? No. So in the areas of membership in the body, justification and spiritual maturity, the formula is the same for men and women. There are not two ways of salvation, one for the man, one for the woman. The spiritual maturity does not have separate systems, one for male, one for female. Both enter the body in the exact same way. Once in the body, the man is still a man, woman is still a woman, and they differ only in position and function. Same with the Jews and Gentiles. So the Bible does not support the idea of Gentiles become spiritual Jews when they believe. Rather, they are spiritual Gentiles when they are controlled by the Holy Spirit. Spiritual Jews are Jews who believe and who also have a proper relationship to the Holy Spirit. They're both distinct and separate. Also, the Bible does not say that all distinctions between Jew and Gentile are erased when they believe. It's very true that the way of salvation is the same for both, but this does not mean that all other distinctions have been eradicated as well. 
because just as we have distinctions between bond and free, male and female, there are also areas of distinctions between Jews and Gentiles. But the way of salvation, body membership, spiritual maturity, same for both Jews and Gentiles. But in other areas, distinctions remain. Now, we're still in this, in this area where we're talking about Israel present and we're looking at Israel today. So, now, back to covenant theologians again. Covenant theologians have a difficult time with the modern state of Israel. Some see it as an accident of history and Israel has no right to exist and they simply wish it would just disappear. Hmm. Others do not respond in an, any anti-Semitic way, but they're ambivalent to it and do not know what to do with the rebirth of the nation theologically, because it's a mystery to them. How did it happen? Well, I, Ezekiel told us that. Now, most dispensationalists don't have a problem. Uh, they see Israel as theologically significant and also as a fulfillment of prophecy. Israel's <clears throat> return to the land is actually a modern-day miracle. Um, one prophet, uh, Ezekiel, more than 500 years before the time of Christ, apparently predicted this would occur. Yeah, in Ezekiel 37, Israel, dead for almost 2,000 years, has returned from the dead, returned from the grave. And that was an absolute miracle. Yeah. Some dispensationists do not know where the state of Israel fits in theologically. And this problem, really, it, it, it's rooted in failure to develop a theology of Israel present. The reestablishment of the Jewish state in 1948 has not only thrown a spanner in a millennial thinking, which says that there's no kingdom, but it also has made a crack in much of pre-millennial thinking. Right? Now, some dispensationalists have concluded that the present state of Israel has nothing to do with the fulfillment of prophecy. My gosh, I, I, how is that possible with what the scriptures say? And, and, and so for some reason, the present state does not fit their system of thought. Therefore, it's viewed as an accident of history. Now, on what grounds is the present state of Israel so dismissed? What's the, what, what makes him say this? The issue that bothers some dispensationalists is the fact that not only have the Jews returned in unbelief into the land, in unbelief regarding the person of Jesus, but most of them are not even Orthodox Jews. In fact, the majority of them in the land are either atheists or, or agnostics. In fact, there's only 28% who are in the land who are considered Orthodox. The rest are whatever you want them to be. Now, so. Israel simply does not fit in with all the biblical passages dealing with the return. Uh, and because remember, you know, the, the scriptures speak of a regenerated nation and this present state of Israel does not fit that picture. So this is why some dispensationalists have a problem with, with the current state of Israel, uh, because on these grounds, the modern nation is dismissed as not being a fulfillment of prophecy because they're saying, but, they're not full of believers. But what's the problem? Well, the real problem is the failure to see that the prophet spoke of two, two international returns to the land. Okay? Not just one, but two. Now, the two returns. First of all, uh, there was to be a regathering in unbelief in preparation for judgment. And it's a judgment of the tribulation. Uh, and this was going to be followed by a second worldwide regathering in faith in preparation for blessings blessings of the messianic kingdom so if one recognizes that the bible speaks of two worldwide regatherings it's easy to see how the present state of israel fits into prophecy spot on bang on it's a, it's a, a regathering the first one in unbelief now one passage clearly dealing with this is ezekiel 20 verses 33 to 38 What's Ezekiel have to say? Well, Ezekiel 20, 33 to 38 says this. Surely with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out, will I be king over you? This is God speaking. And I will bring you out from the peoples, bring him out from the peoples, 
and will gather you out of the countries wherein you are scattered with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out. I'll bring you in on you into the wilderness of the peoples, and there will I enter into judgment with you face to face. And then verse 36 says, like as I entered into judgment with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so will I enter into judgment with you, says the Lord Jehovah. Now, Ezekiel draws a simile between the Exodus and the future return of Israel into the land. At the Exodus, what happened? Well, the entire nation of Israel was brought out of Egypt into the Sinai Peninsula. Uh, and while in the wilderness, uh, God's plan for Israel was to accomplish two things. First of all, he wanted to give them the law, Mosaic law, and then he wanted them to build a tabernacle where they could then practice the law and worship through the tabernacle. Now, after that, they were then to, to move to the promised land, go into the promised land, enjoy it. But guess, guess what they did? A lot of murmurings, a lot of rebellions. And what happened was God finally entered into judgment with his people at a place called Kadesh Barnea, right on the border of the promised land. Now, the judgment that he that was given to them condemned them to 40 years of wandering until the entire generation from the age of 20 years old upward, except for two men, uh, Joshua and Caleb, perished, right? 40 years later, what happened? Whole new nation, nation born as free men in the wilderness and not as slaves in Egypt, was able to enter the land under Joshua. Okay, so according to Ezekiel, a similar thing is going to occur in the future. God will first gather or regather his people from all over the world where they have been scattered. And this gathering is going to be not in faith, but it's going to be in unbelief. And it's seen from the fact that it says, with a mighty hand, with an outstretched arm, and with wrath poured out. Now, twice he says this in, in Ezekiel, it's verses 33 and 34. Now, this regathering in unbelief occurs after wrath has been poured out on the people. Now, it's no accident that the state of Israel was born out of the fires of the Nazi Holocaust, where wrath was poured out. Once this gathering has taken place, God will then enter into judgment with his people, namely the tribulation judgments. And by means of these judgments, verse 38, I will purge out from among you the rebels. No more rebellion in my people. Then what's going to happen? It's going to be a whole new nation, a regenerated nation that will be able to enter the Messianic land of Israel under King Messiah. Now, Ezekiel 20, 33 to 38, clearly speaks of a regathering in unbelief in preparation for judgment. What else? Ezekiel 22, 17 to 22, there's a similar thing. Uh, again, talking to Ezekiel, son of man, house of Israel is dross unto me. Because you are all, um, I'm skipping a few verses here. Because you are all become dross, therefore behold, I will gather you into the midst of Jerusalem as they gather silver and brass and iron and lead and tin into the midst of the furnace to blow the fire upon it, to melt it. So will I gather you in mine anger and in my wrath, and I will lay you there and melt you. And, and further on in, in verse 22, and you shall know that I, Jehovah, have poured out my wrath upon you. So this passage in Ezekiel 22, 17 to, 20, 17 to 22, speaks of a regathering in preparation for judgment. And this passage clearly states that this is a regathering in unbelief relating in particular to the city of Jerusalem. Another passage, while primarily dealing with uh, the regeneration of Israel, Ezekiel 36, 22 to 24, Ezekiel here makes it clear that a regathering takes place before that regeneration. Verse 23, I will sanctify my great name which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in the midst of them. And the nations shall know that I am Jehovah, says the Lord Jehovah, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the nations and gather you out of all the countries and will bring you into your own land. So there we go. 
you're going to be brought into the land and he's going to, because they've caused his name to be profane and then judgment's going to be poured out and then later on comes the regeneration. Now, Isaiah 11, verses 11 to 12, deals with a similar situation, except this one gives us a little, little clue here now. It shall come to, this is verse 11, Isaiah 11. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people. That shall remain from Assyria, from Egypt, Pathos, Cush, Elam, Shinar, and from the islands of the sea. Verse 12, you'll set up an end sign for the nations and will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Regathering spoken of in this passage is one in faith in preparation for millennial kingdom. And this is regathering in faith is specifically stated to be a second one, a second worldwide regathering. So when did the first regathering occur, worldwide regathering occur? Wasn't the Babylonian one from exile, returned from exile, and that wasn't a worldwide one, that wasn't international, it was just local. First international regathering is the one that would be in preparation for judgment. So this passage, Isaiah 11, 11 to 12, speaks of two international regatherings while emphasizing the second one, the second time. The second regathering will be in faith, but not the first. Now, so far, uh, we've, sp we've spoken about a, a regathering in unbelief in preparation for judgment. It just tells us that there's going to be one. It doesn't tell us when. Okay? So is it going to be before the tribulation, after the tribulation, during the tribulation? It doesn't say. But Zephaniah, little prophet Zephaniah, chapter 2, verses 1 to 2, pinpoints the regathering in unbelief as occurring before the tribulation period. Zephaniah 2, verse 1 and 2. Gather yourselves together. Yes, gather together, O nation that has no shame. I have no shame because they're still sinful. Before the decree bring forth, before the day pass the chaff, before the, fer the fierce anger of Jehovah come upon you, before the day of Jehovah's anger come upon you. So in, in the preceding section of Zephaniah, uh, chapter 1, verses 14 to 18, Zephaniah describes some features of a time called the great day of Jehovah, or, or some translations might have the day of the Lord. In the past, we've learned that this is the most common Old Testament name for the tribulation. So in Zephaniah chapter 2, verses 1 to 2, Zephaniah speaks of an event that is to occur before the great day of Jehovah begins. Now in verse 1, the nation of Israel is told to gather together. This is clearly a gathering in unbelief because if you see in verse 2, the word before it's used three times in relation to the preceding passage regarding the tribulation. One of these befores is before the day of Jehovah itself, before the tribulation. Now, other passages speak of a regathering in unbelief in preparation for judgment. This passage clearly states that this regathering in unbelief will occur before the tribulation begins. When does the tribulation begin? Well, Daniel 9, 27 tells us it begins with the signing of the seven-year covenant, not with the rapture, but the seven-year covenant. And this covenant is made between the Antichrist and the leaders of Israel at that time. So the signing of such a covenant presupposes a Jewish leadership of a Jewish state. Such a Jewish state has to exist before such a covenant can be signed. And this demands the existence of a Jewish state before the tribulation. And this is a state that exists today. It's in the land, has its own leaders. Now, what do we say regarding these regatherings? The present state of Israel is a fulfillment of those passages that speak of a worldwide regathering in unbelief in preparation for judgment. That is the judgment of the great tribulation. This is a bit of a, a bit of a table here. Uh, we see here the table of the two regatherings. First, the present or first regathering in unbelief, worldwide return to part of the land, Jerusalem. Second, return in unbelief, restoration of the land. But that this is a work of the Lord. It goes mostly unrecognized because it's a secular, secular nation, secular focus. But it also sets the stage for the tribulation. 
discipline. The second international regathering, it's a worldwide return to all the land, it's a return in faith, it's a restoration to the land, and the whole nation recognizes that this is the work of the Lord. Spiritual focus. First regathering, it's a secular focus. We're just back into the land, We're not thinking about gods. Now, the second international regathering, it sets the stage for the millennium, which is the blessings of the kingdom. Okay. Romans chapter 9, verse 1 to 11, verse 24. We're going to look at the remnant and the olive tree. Not all of it today, but we're going to look at some of it today. Yeah. The doctrine of the remnant teaches that there is always a segment of the Jewish people who are believers. The teaching of the New Testament is that the remnant of Israel today comprises the Jewish believers in Messiahship of Jesus, Yeshua. And that's primarily found in Romans chapters 9 to 11. Uh, okay, yeah. One other passage uh, on the remnant of Israel relevant, and that is 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. And look at the background to this, 1 Peter 2, 1 to 10. By taking Peter's words literally in, in, in chapter 1, verses 1 to 2, it's clear right in the beginning of, of Peter's uh, first epistle, it's clear that the epistle was not written to the church at large, nor to a body of Gentile believers, but to Jewish believers living outside the land within a majority Gentile population. It says to the elect who are sojourners of the dispersion. Now, the word dispersion, diaspora, is a technical Jewish term for Jews who live outside the land of Israel. It's used, well, Jews, uh, Jews who live here in Australia today are in the diaspora, the dispersion. It's used twice, twice elsewhere, namely in John chapter 7, verse 35, John 7, 35, and James chapter 1, verse 1. Yeah, all commentators agree that the term refers to the Jews of the diaspora. There's no reason to make First Peter the exception since it fits well into Peter's calling. Who was he? He was the apostle to the circumcision. He's apostle to the Jews. See that in Galatians chapter 2, verses 7 to 8. If you want to have a look there. Now, Peter keeps referring to the fact that his readers live among the Gentiles in, 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 his, in, uh, in his first epistle. Uh, first Peter 2, 12, talk about the behavior among the Gentiles. First Peter uh, four three speaks about you know don't share the desire of the Gentiles. Now, I've heard this preached as well too. Uh, many try to make the term Gentiles mean unbelievers, but that's not its Jewish usage, uh, and that, in fact, it's rarely even the New Testament usage. Peter is using the term Gentile. Peter's writing to Jewish believers. He's using the term Gentile in its normal usage as meaning a non-Jew. Peter's addressing Jewish believers living among a majority Gentile population. Expressions such as uh, in, in, in 1 Peter 1.18, it says, vain, such as vain meaning of life handed down from your fathers. Well, that's a Jewish, that's Jewish terminology. That's Jewish overtones. So uh, this is Jewish believers, distinguishing Jewish believers from their past lives under rabbinic Judaism. Now, 1 Peter 2, 1 to 10, Peter draws a contrast between the remnant and the non-remnant. His purpose is to show that while the non-remnant has failed in its calling, the remnant has not failed. And Peter describes the spiritual state of the remnant, putting away therefore all, this is a, a verses 1 to, to, to 3, Peter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2. Putting away, therefore, all wickedness and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings as newborn babes long for the spiritual milk which is without guile, that you may grow thereby unto salvation if you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. So, first three verses, he, he deals with the, with, the, with the spiritual state of the remnant. Then Peter deals with the topic of the stone of stumbling and the rock of offense in verses 4 to 10. Now, Messiah Yeshua is the living stone who, though rejected by men, is elect and precious with God. That's verse 4. Verse 4 tells us that. 
with the Exodus in chapter in, in with sorry with with Exodus nineteen verses five to six Exodus nineteen five to six this is Peter's thinking Exodus nineteen five to six here Peter states that the Jewish believers are two things because of the kind of salvation they have received in verse five first of all they are living stones and so are part of a spiritual house. The spiritual house is the spiritual house of Israel. It's the remnant of Israel, or Paul, Paul uses the words, the Israel of God. Second, the Jewish believers are a holy priesthood. And this too was the calling of the nation as a whole, right? The nation as a whole were supposed to be a, a, a royal priesthood, a holy priesthood. The nation failed. But the remnant of Israel has not failed and is today offering spiritual sacrifices to the Lord. Peter then goes on to explain the distinction between the remnant and the non-remnant in verses 6 to 8. He begins with the state of the remnant in verse, verse 6, the first part of verse 7. And he quotes from Isaiah 28 verse 16. And he points out that the chief cornerstone is the Messiah who before God the Father is elect and precious. Therefore, those who believe in him, the chief cornerstone, Messiah, will not be shamed. Peter then makes the application in the first part of verse 7 and states that while the messianic stone, the stone which the builders rejected, is indeed precious, it is only precious for the remnant, for those who believe in the messianic stone. Concerning the non-remnant, we see in the second part of verse 7 and verse 8. Here, Peter quotes from Psalm 118, verse 22. And, he, show, and he, he does this to show that it was predicted that the Messianic stone would be rejected by the leaders of Israel. And he also goes and quotes from Isaiah chapter 8, verse 14, uh, that's verse 8, to show that for the unbeliever, the messianic stone was to be the stone of a stone of stumbling, and it was to be the rock of offense. And Peter concludes now with the application in the second part of verse eight. The non-remnant indeed stumbled. For those who rejected the word were destined to stumble. Isaiah predicted that Emmanuel would be the point of division between the remnant and the non-remnant. And Peter teaches that this has now taken place and Yeshua, the Messiah, has become that point of division. Now, the passage concludes, uh, 1 Peter 2, 1 to 10 passage concludes with a further description of the status of the remnant in verses 9 to 10. According to verse 5, the remnant of Israel comprised a spiritual house and a holy priesthood. Now, with Exodus 19, 5 to 6, still in the back of his mind, Peter now adds four other descriptions to show the position of the remnant in contrast to Israel, the whole. This is the first part of verse 9. First of all, they are an elect race. This is based on Isaiah 43, verse 20. Being elect shows that the people were chosen at God's initiative. First Peter 2, 4. And six. This is a reference to their individual selection or individual election. And the use of the term race shows that Peter is also dealing with their national election. The race is their Jews. The church, however, is not a race, but it's composed of believers from all different races. So he's speaking specifically to Israel here. Second, the second position. The remnant of Israel is a royal priesthood. Now, in verse 5, they are called a holy priesthood, emphasizing their right to approach the heavenly sanctuary. Now they're also a royal priesthood. Now, since Jesus, since Yeshua is a priest king after the order of Melchizedek, you can check that out in, in uh, Hebrews 7, verses 1 to 28, Hebrews 7, 1 to 28. These believers are a royal priesthood. Why? Because they're both priests and kings. Now, while it is true that all believers comprise a priesthood, the priesthood of all believers cannot 
legitimately be derived from this particular passage because this is speaking about the race, the Jewish race, Israel, the Israel of God. However, it's taught in Revelation chapter 1, verse 6, and Revelation 5, verse 10, Revelation 1, 6, Revelation 5, 10, and Revelation 20, verse 6. That's the priesthood of all believers. Okay. Third, the believing Jewish remnant is a holy nation. Israel became a nation at Mount Sinai and was called upon to be, a, to be holy and to be separated from sin to God. But the nation failed. As a whole, they failed. The remnant has not failed. The church is not a nation. Romans 10, 19 tells us that very clearly. But it is comprised of believers from all nations. The fourth position, the remnant is a people for God's own possession. Now, this is not only based on Exodus 19, 5 to 6, but also on Deuteronomy 7, verse 6, and Deuteronomy 14, verse 2, and Deuteronomy 26, verse 28. Was it 18? What a moment. Uh, typo. Isaiah 43, verse 21. Malachi 3, verse 17. Yeah. While the Jewish people became a nation at Mount Sinai, they became a people with Abraham through Isaac and Jacob. Right? They're always a people, descendants of Jacob. They're a people. The remnant is God's own possession. For those Jewish believers, where, yeah, why, why are they his possession? Because they were purchased by the blood of the Messiah. And so they uniquely belong to God. And that's 1 Peter 1, uh, 18 to 19. 1 Peter 1, 18 to 19. Now, Peter, having described the status of the remnant, next gives the purpose for their election. And this is the second part of verse 9. To show forth the excellencies of the attributes of the God who called them out of darkness and into his glorious light. So what, it, what he's saying here is that they're to proclaim the message to those outside. And the background to this comes from Isaiah 43, verses 20 to 21. So they are now the light that Israel, the nation, was not. The section now concludes with a reference to Hosea 1, verses 10 to, 10 to 2, verse 1, and verse 23. So this is verse 10 of 1 Peter 2, verses 1 to 10. Now, formerly in times past, the Jewish believers were part of the non-remnant being not my people. This comes out of Hosea, not my people, and they were without mercy. Now they are members of the remnant, and so are my people, and have obtained my mercy. So th this is where Peter picks this up from, from Hosea 1, uh, 10 to 2, verse 1 and, and verse 23. So what's Peter doing? Or what is Peter not doing? What's Peter not doing in, in 1 Peter 2, 1 to 10? Well, Peter is not drawing a distinction between Israel and the church or between unbelieving Jews and believing Gentiles. That's not what he's doing here at all. The distinction here, what he, what he is doing, is between Jews who believe and Jews who do not believe. His point here is that while Israel as a whole, Israel as a nation, on the whole, failed. But the believing remnant of Israel has not failed. And so the remnant of Israel is fulfilling the calling of the nation as a whole. And Paul will make the same point in his theology of Israel when we get to Romans 9 to 11. Yeah. Romans 9 verses 1 to 11, 24. You will see some commentaries. They'll skip chapters 9 to 11. I won't even talk about it. Uh, and so uh, the expositors seem to not take what God says about Israel too seriously and teach that the church is a new Israel. And they are therefore then feel that these chapters are important. But it's God's word. 
Now, other commentaries that do take chapters 9 to 11 somewhat seriously, and they comment upon them, will often refer to these three chapters uh, as being merely parenthetical and actually not part of Paul's main argument. But nothing can be further from the truth. What's the place of chapters 9 to 11 in the book of Romans? It's always wrong to ignore three whole chapters of scripture that God has put into the text because he certainly must have had a reason for including them. And also, uh, chapters 9 to 11 are not parenthetical. If anything, they're pivotal because these three chapters vindicate God's righteousness in his relationship to Israel. In the first eight chapters of the book of Romans, Paul dealt with the theology of the righteousness of God. It's the one, chapters 1 to 8. After introducing the book in chapter 1, verses 1 to 17, he then spelled out the details of the theology of God's righteousness. And in the first three chapters, he pointed out that everyone has fallen short of the righteous standards of God. Everyone. And that includes all sections of humanity, pagan Gentiles, cultured Gentiles, and the Jews. Now, Paul concludes that all have sinned and have come short of the righteousness of God, and that's found in Romans 3, 19 to 31. Now, having shown that everyone is a sinner, both Jews and Gentiles, and everyone has fallen short of the righteousness of God, Paul then describes what God has done in order to provide righteousness for humanity. He provided righteousness, excuse me, I've got itchy nose, provided righteousness through salvation in Yeshua the Messiah. And this salvation has three tenses, past, present, and future. Past aspect of our salvation is justification. Romans 4, verse 1 to Romans 5, verse 21. Once one believes he's justified or he's declared righteous by God. So the present aspect of our salvation is sanctification. And that's found in Romans 6, verse 1 to Romans 8, verse 18. Sanctification is the work of the Holy Spirit in the believer's life, conforming him more and more into the image of the Son of God. So the, this, this, this is the present aspect, sanctification. The future aspect of, sal of salvation is glorification, and that's found in Romans 8, chapter Romans chapter 8, verses 19 to 39. Now, glorification is guaranteed in light of the fact that believers have been justified and they're being sanctified, and therefore, will some to be glorified and be like Messiah. Now, at the end of chapter 8, as he concludes the, the, the theology of God's righteousness, Paul points out that in light of all that God has done for believers in justification, sanctification, glorification, there is absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Nothing in heaven can separate us, nothing on earth, nothing below the earth, nothing outside of us, nothing inside of us, not even we ourselves can separate us from the love of God. So, if that's the case, one would think that having stated all of this, Paul would immediately proceed to deal with the practice of God's righteousness because he did this in, in other, other of his epistles. In, in Ephesians 1 to 3, for instance, he dealt with theology, then 4 to 6, practical application. So now, Paul has spelled out the theology of God's righteousness in chapters 1 to 8, but he doesn't immediately proceed to the practice of God's righteousness. This he does in, in chapters 12 to 16. Instead, what he does here is between the theology of God's righteousness in chapters 1 to 8 and the practice of his, right, his righteousness in, in chapters 12 to 16, Paul inserted three chapters dealing with God's righteousness in his relationship with Israel. Well, why did he insert these three chapters? The end of chapter 8, Paul concluded that in light of all that God has done, in light of his promises, there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Now, at this point, one might object and say, but hang on. But did not Israel have promises from God? And did not God make certain promises and commitments to Israel? 
that included the national salvation and the worldwide restoration. Yet the majority of Israel is in a state of unbelief. It doesn't seem that God's promises to Israel have been kept. That's what someone looking from outside could say. If God, so what they then say is, well, if God's promises to Israel have not been kept, how can we really believe that there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God? Since it seems that Israel has been separated from the love of God. So Paul must deal with the question of God's righteousness in his relationship with Israel. And that will put paid to this question. So are these chapters 9 to 11 parenthetical? No way. These chapters should not be viewed simply as just an afterthought or unrelated to Paul's argument, nor should they be ignored as some commentators do. They should be considered pivotal in that they justify or vindicate God's righteousness in his relationship with Israel. They form a bridge between the theology of God's righteousness in chapters 1 to 8 and the practice of God's righteousness in chapters 12 to 16. That's why 9 to 11 are there. It's the bridge between these two. Paul asks three questions in his development of this uh, Israelology in 9 to 11. Where he, answers, he answers three questions. First question is, well, why are they so few Jews being saved when the gospel is to the Jew first? In Romans 1, 16, Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul wrote that the gospel is to the Jew first. And if that's true, why then are so few Jews being saved? Well, Paul confesses that he has a, a deep love and sorrow for Israel. And that's, he, he does it in chapter 9, 1 to 5. And he then teaches that their rejection of the messiahship of Yeshua was not due to a failure in God's part. He tells us that in Romans 9, 6 to 13. Nor was it due to an injustice in the part of God. He tells us that in Romans 9, 14 to 29. The real problem is their own rejection of the righteousness of God. And that's found in Romans 9, verse 30 to Romans 10, verse 21. However, consolation is to be found in the salvation of the remnant in our day, according to the election of grace. And that's found in Romans 11, verses 1 to 10. Consolation could also be seen in the present acceptance of the Gentiles. That's in Romans 11, verses 11 to 22. And finally, consolation should also be seen in, in that in the future, all Israel will believe and there will be a future restoration of Israel. And that's found in Romans 11, verses 23 to 32. All of these consolations are evidence of the wisdom and the glory of God, which we find in Romans 11, verses 33 to 36. The second question is, well, how do the Gentiles know that they can trust God when his promises to Israel have not been fulfilled? Logical question in light of what Paul said at the end of chapter 8. Summarizes answer to this question, Paul says three things. First of all, he says that Israel's failure is related to spiritual pride and self-sufficiency. And the fault does not lie with God. It lies with Israel. Second, Israel's rejection is neither complete nor total because there are Jewish people who did not reject the Messiahship of Yeshua. Third, Israel's rejection is not final. In fact, the nation as a nation will receive the Messiah sometime in the future. The third question that Paul answers in these chapters is, has the gospel nullified God's promises to Israel? He responds with a very firm, no, it does not. The last point to consider by way of introduction is that in Romans in, in verses chapters 9 to 11, Paul expounded further upon a statement he made in Romans 3, verse 1. What advantage then has the Jew? Or what is the profit of circumcision? Much every way. Just how much in every way is what Paul deals with in these three crucial chapters of Romans. That's Romans 9 to 11. Okay. Now, we're going to look at the theology of Israel's rejection 
in verse in chapter 9 verses 1 to 29 and we're going to look at Paul's sorrow and Israel's privileges in chapter 9 verses 1 to 5. I say the truth in Messiah I lie not my conscience bearing witness with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing pain in my heart for I could wish that I myself were anathema from Messiah for my brethren's sake, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, whose the, is the adoption and the glory and the covenants, the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers and of whom is Messiah as concerning the flesh, whose over all, whose over all God blessed forever. Amen. Paul introduces his theme on the theology of Israel by pointing to his own sorrow. He describes his own emotions in verses 1 to 3 over Israel's rejection. Having a strong Jewish and Pharisaic background, Paul realized the truth of what he was saying had to be affirmed at the mouth of two or three witnesses. And so he presented these witnesses, his conscience, and the Holy Spirit. We see in Romans 9 verse 1. Paul's conscience and the Holy Spirit are bearing witness to something. You know, that something is the fact that Paul has great sorrow. That's verse 2. And the Greek word for sorrow means grief. It's to be in a state of mind that is proje projecting grief. He also has unceasing pain. And now this is the physical expression of that mental anguish. Paul can truly testify by his conscience and through the Holy Spirit that he has great mental anguish over Israel. And this mental anguish has resulted in physical pain. Paul is that concerned over his own people. He then expresses his desire. I could wish, verse 3, what he's wishing is that he could be anathema, that he could be set apart for destruction if it would mean Israel's immediate salvation. In other words, Paul was willing to go to hell and to, to the lake of fire if it would bring about Israel's salvation. This wish was not for the lost in general, but it was specifically on behalf of the Jewish people who were Paul's kinsmen according to the flesh. These were not his spiritual brethren. These were his physical brethren, the Jewish people. However, he realized this was not the way it was going to happen. He was simply expressing a personal desire. Paul next outlined Israel's privileges and Israel's prerogatives in verses 4 to 5. And the purpose of listing these privileges and prerogatives was to show that Israel really should have received the Messiah, but did not. This was their fault. It was not the fault of God. Also, if they did not believe, these privileges and prerogatives did not guarantee their salvation. Altogether, Paul lists eight things. First of all, he lists the adoption. This is speaking of Israel's national adoption, which we find back in Exodus chapter 4, verse 22, by which Israel became the national son of God. Just as believers are individually children of God by adoption, Israel as a nation is the national son of God. Israel was never disinherited from that position. And you can check that out in Isaiah 63, 16, Jeremiah 3, 17 to 19, and Jeremiah 31, verse 9 and verse 20. So the first thing is the adoption. Second thing is the glory. Specifically, this is the Shekinah glory. This is the visible manifestation of God's presence. And this also belonged to Israel. Exodus 13, 20 to 21 and Exodus 16, verse 10 and verse 40. Exodus 40, verse 34 to 38. So we have the adoption, the glory. Then we have the covenants. These covenants are the four unconditional eternal covenants that God made with Israel. First of all, we have the Abrahamic covenant the Land Covenant, the Davidic Covenant, and the New Covenant. And then we had the law. Specifically, this is the one conditional and temporary covenant God made with Israel 
the Mosaic covenant, which contained the Mosaic law. And that's found in Exodus 19, verse 16 to Exodus 20, verse 1. Then we have the service of God. Now, this service included the priesthood, the entire Levitical priesthood, and all the various offerings. And uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verses 1 to 10 uh, reaffirms this to us. Then we have the promises. And these, specifically, these are the messianic promises. The promises, for instance, of the first coming, of the second coming, and of the establishment of Messiah's kingdom, through which he's going to rule the world righteously. Uh, so the world in general, and Israel in particular. Then we have the fathers. These are the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Deuteronomy 10, 14 to 15, uh, Hebrews 11, 1 to 12, verse 2 tells us this. Uh, and through the, it is through these fathers that the Jewish nation came into being and was established. Uh, the biblical definition, remember, of a Jew is one who is a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then they had the Messiah himself. Concerning the Messiah, he states three things about the Messiah. First of all, concerning the flesh, he was born a Jew. So in his humanity, he was a Jew and he had a physical relationship to Israel. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, Galatians 4, verse 4, and Hebrews 7, verse 14 tells us this. Second, he was over all. What does that mean? It just means it's emphasizing his sovereignty. All authority is his in heaven and earth and in everywhere else. Third, he is God blessed forever. He is God who is blessed forever, and that emphasizes his deity. Yeshua himself affirmed Paul's claim that the Messiah is Israel's when he said, I have not come but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And that is found in Matthew chapter 15, verse 24. And with that, we will finish this session 10 and study hard, grow strong. We'll see you next week for the next session. Thanks for coming along.